welcome everybody. Um, people are still coming in, so um, just wanted to thank you all for being here for Ten Bounds Leadership in a Remote World Conference. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. I uh, want to make sure to encourage you all to visit the arena. Uh, there's a lot of great um, booths happening there with conversations with all of, all of the companies here in this panel, so you can continue the continue the conversation there. Uh, we do ask you to keep your mics muted and please use the Q&A section of the chat box to send your questions to the panel. So I would like to introduce the panel. Um, we have Moses Castillo from Outreach. Uh, we have Rebecca Garber from Love Jump. We have Jeremy Laville from Lead IQ, and Joe Venuti from Sundoso will be your moderator for this conversation on remote burnout, beating the quarantine blues. Over to you, Joe. Thanks so much, Renee, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, really excited to be chatting on this panel with um, some amazing sales leaders. We do have quite a bit we wanna cover, so I'm gonna kind of jump in and point the first question over at Jeremy. Um, so Jeremy, since pivoting uh, into a remote work environment, have you seen an increase in rep burnout? And if so, what are you doing to combat it? Yeah, um, yeah, it's great to be here too. Thanks for joining everybody. Um, yeah, I would say um, for me personally, um, speaking as like a rep, because um, I'm like in a um, individual contributor rep position um, rather than leadership. Um, like one thing that I just did recently um, I took a, a day, a PT day, just like as mental, a mental health day. And like when in, my, in our HR system where, um, you know, it says like reason for taking the PTO day, like, and it's just as optional, like you don't have to say anything. Like I just put like avoid burnout smileys. Um, and then my manager, um, she saw that. And then she was like, Hey, you know what? Um, We'll just give the whole team, you know, th so it's this this Friday, we're just all, you know, taking a mental health day to kind of recharge and and like literally um, avoid burnout. So that's the things that I'm trying to do. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Rebecca, how about you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that we are all in agreement here that there definitely has been an increase in burnout. And something that I really like to think about when I think about this issue is that if you think about coming to work every day, I think there's a cultural aspect and the spirit aspect of like coming to work and, and liking the people that you work with and enjoying your position. And then there's the idea of motivation. And that's, are you actually motivated to do the day-to-day -day of your job? And I think that being remote and being in lockdown created an even larger focus on the importance of the motivation piece of the BDR role. And I think that the team needs to be genuinely motivated to do their job because we don't have the spirit to fall back on right now. We don't have snacks. We don't have the ping pong room. We don't have the ability to laugh with our colleagues. And so as a leader, I think I've really taken it upon myself to uncover and really ask what motivates my individual team members to their job, not necessarily to come to work, that's a different issue, I think, and to address those things. And something that I've really focused on um, internally is career planning because a lot of my team, you know, what motivates them to come to work is, you know, job progression. So I've doubled down and I'm going to be spending a lot of time making sure that's very clear to them. Um, also, we're taking an organizational approach to help elevate the BDR role internally. So we have BDR calls of the week where the entire organization is exposed to um, what the BDRs are doing on a day to day basis. And we also really make sure to highlight the importance of the BDR role whenever we can. So really, my takeaway um, to all of you is, is to really focus on motive on the motivation bit, especially when it comes to the BDR role. Yeah, good stuff. I think that like there's that fine balance of keeping people engaged and motivated, but also like monitoring just how, how many hours a day or a week they're on too. Um, Moses, are you running into the same sort of thing? Yeah, I think we can we can all say that we've seen burnout increase, which uh, is I think one of the reasons we're, we're chatting today. But I think one of the one of the things we 
we're not counting on. We, we figured, hey, this is going to be an adjustment to working from home, but we weren't counting on actually the physical impact it was going to start having on people's bodies, the level of stress, the level of burnout. And uh, that was something we needed to be very cognizant of because across the org, and I think other, uh, we were talking to other sales organizations as well, we saw an increase of people uh, needing to take time off for, for medical reasons. And we knew that this was attached to the, the, this change that we had just seen, right? Which is the, the work from home environment. And uh, doing a lot of the things that Rebecca was mentioning there, uh, as far as like bringing in more more people to highlight, understanding, really understanding them uh, even, even more intimately from what motivates them beyond the paycheck. Uh, but also what we did was we came to the table with an idea very similar to what Jeremy had mentioned and said, hey, we just you just need to get out. You just need to get out and focus on your mental health, you gotta focus on physical health. And uh, it was obvious that reps wouldn't do that uh, on their own if they weren't uh, being directed to, because they have a number to hit, you know? And that stress is always on them. So unless you tell them, don't come to work today, they will come to work and try to hit that number or overachieve on their number. So we came to uh, our, our organization, not just for the sales development board, but for uh, the go to market team in general, has uh, we all have a, an extra day off of PTO that we're mandated to take off uh, once a month. So um, every org was able to kind of choose the day that worked best for them because obviously, end of the month for AEs uh, versus SDRs would look a little bit different. So we all got to choose ours, but that was a huge uh, additional bonus that we were kind of testing out and actually started to work really well with uh, uh, with the way everybody was handling the burnout. So that was one way that we came to, uh, one one approach that we took. Yeah. Was, Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I wanted to chime in because I, I love that idea. And I think, you know, even from talking with my reps and, and people at Level Jump, I think there's almost this um, hesitation to take vacation at this point. Um, I think it's twofold. I think, number one, people are sick of being at home and what's a vacation if you have to be at home. And number two, I think that people are kind of holding on to this idea that the world is going to dramatically change and I'm going to go on this fabulous trip. So I'm going to stockpile all of my vacation days in order to accommodate that. But unfortunately, I think the reality is, is that although there's been some really fantastic progressions made as of late, we're still quite far away from that. And I think that as a manager, it's important to um, really encourage people to be taking vacation on a regular basis and not worrying so much about, you know, that big trip at the end of the year when things are back to normal. So Moses, I love that, you know, there's a more of a focus on that, on, on the immediacy of what that can solve. Yeah, I think it's all super interesting. If you had asked me a year and a half ago, would we have more people, you know, calling out sick if we were working remote? I would have said, no, people will never call out sick because there's, there's more flexibility. But sure enough, with the state endemic and just everything else going on, um, like to Moses' point, right? We saw a big spike in people just needing a mental health day. I can't tell you how many times I got the, the slack or the email, Joe, I hope it's okay. I, I just need to clear my head this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, I was, we're very fortunate, you know, Sendoso recognizes it was a trend across multiple departments. So there was absolutely, um, every now and then they'd come in and just, hey, next Friday, company holiday, you know, no one on slack, take the day, refresh. So. All that was super helpful, right? And I think like this kind of pivots into the thing I wanted to touch on is work-life balance, right? I know for me specifically, I was never great at turning the computer off before. Now that there's no more commute, there's no more like separation from my office to home. It's like you go in, you work, you out, like now I'm in dad mode, right? My two kids are running around, it's dinner time. And then like I'm back on email. Um, mm -hmm. And I saw that starting to trickle down to, to the SDRs and that was really, really concerning to me. Did you guys see a change in like work-life balance, right? Meaning hours on for your reps. And what did you do to try to curve it and help them maintain that healthy balance? Uh, Moses, you want to kick us off? Yeah. So the these refresh days were, were a huge part of that, um, of, of being intentional. Uh, but also one of the things that we did as a leadership team was we we recognize we would recognize um, we'd have more one, so let, let me back up we actually started with having more one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with our reps realizing they were uh, both 
from a performance standpoint, but also how they were doing. We're now checking in at a much uh, higher rate of how they're doing as humans, as individuals. And if we noted that there was a, somebody on our team that needed, that was struggling, and we couldn't really put our finger on why uh, a certain output was just out of sorts. This is not normal for this particular rep. They're usually on top of uh, this, this content or, or this ask. Um, but they were really struggling. We we would say, hey, it, it sounds like you just need to reset and take the rest of the day off. Um, we as a management team weren't slacking our um, our teams past uh, four o'clock uh, or four thirty, uh, unless it was something urgent until five o'clock. But after five, we weren't reaching out to our teams, uh, asking them for things or reminders for things. We were very intentional about not bothering them, um, and. It was the SDR team as a whole just learned to unplug after that. So if we did catch anybody on, we saw the little green light on Slack, <laughs> message them and say, "What are you doing on here?" <laughs> but off Slack, I'll see you tomorrow. Like, ah, oh, I need to make sure that I understand. You got to be careful with this. So we 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 took some measures in that sense to, to try to help our team. Yeah, super interesting. I think. Um the concept around like pinging people off hours and on weekends when we first went work from home i was the biggest offender and i didn't realize i was doing it and then i would see a message from like an sdr at like 6 30 in the morning joe so sorry i, I was asleep when you sent this and I had kind of i had that aha moment like okay joe just make yourself a note send it in the morning because in my head like i wasn't expecting a response it was just top of mind but um perceptions ever right um so rebecca how about work-life balance um how, how are you managing it Absolutely. I actually, what you were just touching on in terms of just communication um, is exactly what I was going to address. And I think that um, as a manager, um, I play an important role as I'm the linchpin between leadership and um, junior frontline employees. And in a circumstance where exactly what Joe just described, um, really what happens is that the the person that's lower on the totem pole, like they're the one that actually is suffering in that circumstance um, because they feel like they need to write back, um, you know, and they apologize. And I think just co communicating upwards and advocating for mental health initiatives, for, you know, the type of burnout that I'm seeing on my team um, and making it really explicit about what that actually could mean for the company um, financially. I mean, you could have reps burnt out, you can have reps leaving. And I think it's just as a major, it's really on us to communicate um, and create that space for the more junior people um, to actually reduce burnout. Um, and it all starts from the top and it's, it's, it's a very expensive one. So those are things that I'm, I'm certainly cognizant of well and with my communication as well and, and encouraging leadership to be cognizant because at the end, in the end, they're not the ones that are going to suffer. It's going to be the more junior employees and we need to protect them in those circumstances. Yeah, 100 percent. Jeremy, how about you as someone that's uh, trying to push deals across the finish line? And you know, I, I know you always put a lot of hours in anyways. How are you kind of managing it on a personal level? Yeah, it's it's not easy. And like along the lines of, you know, you guys were saying sometimes um, later in the day, if it's if it's like after five or whatever, you don't slack the person. One thing that's challenging um, internally, our, we have a global company, even though we're kind of small. Um, our whole software development team is in Singapore. And so like our monthly all hands call, the only time that we can all our whole company can be on the call, like I'm in the East Coast here in the Boston area. In our monthly all hands call every month, my time is either at 8.30 p.m. or 9.30 p.m. Like depending on, um, I don't know, it just depends. Time, time zones are weird. Um, and, and so um, that's one thing that, that, that's challenging. So like the other day, every other day during the month, like one thing I re really try to do to balance that out is every other day during the month, if it's not on all hands, like, I, you know, nights, weekends, you know, if it's after five, I really try to like unplug and turn off all the notifications like don't do anything where like you know, if i'm getting an email or slack or whatever like i have to like especially lately i find myself really trying to be more conscious of it because before you know i was just all hours just like checking my phone emailing people so lately i'm like trying i'm finding that i'm starting to get burnt out a little bit and so lately i've been making a more conscious effort to if it's nights weekends like i'm in the house 
um, because I kind of like separate space here, like here where I'm in the garage. Like if I'm in the house, like that's family time, you know, and like that notification or that email, I can just put it off um, until the morning when I'm when I'm back in work mode. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that you pivot to work home. You think I have all this time with my family, but you've got to be very, very intentional about it in some cases more so now than before. Um, because it is so easy to just walk down the hall and fire up the laptop or, or whatever it might be. Um, so we kind of started down this road of, you know, blocking people off hours and, and you know, the way that we're communicating. So on that thread, how are you using tools like Slack and Zoom now? I guess, are you using them any differently now than you were pre-pandemic or right at the beginning of quarantine? I, I, I know I certainly am but I'd be interested to see how that's kind of evolved and, and your culture has shifted throughout this last year. Um, Moses, how about you? Yeah, so um, this is really, th this is a great question because uh, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, I don't know about y'all, uh, but I, I felt like our, our message was now that we're not all together, we need to over communicate to our people what's happening and make sure that we're, we're communicating. So the slacks, and the Zooms and everything just exploded. Um, and then that's when we started seeing like a, a lot of unhealthy behavior from management to, to rep. Like, you're always you're always on me, you know? And it's like, no, you know, we just want to make sure we're communicating, et cetera. And I actually found that uh, a, a couple things. One, uh, going back to the, the previous question about like work-life balance, slowing down, it's kind of intuitive, right? we pushed the limit up but actually reversing that and saying hey i'm gonna let you unfortunately with a tool like outreach i can see what my reps are up to all day so i can actually uh get a lot of the information i need without actually slacking my reps um and so giving them that autonomy is actually uh the reaction that has been like an excellent like thank you for not you know that feeling of micromanaging is gone they really came on very strong especially those tenured reps that you have um, the other thing uh, about the, the tools is that we started started being a little bit more conscious of uh, how we're using the tools because it's it's not that Slack or Zoom are bad tools. Technology actually helps. It's like how we were using them, and uh, we had a tendency at the beginning, especially, to just you know send information and or get the point. This is what I need. We get on Zoom and we're talking about agenda items because we've got to be efficient. Uh, on this particular meeting is in the conversations uh, like how are you doing the water cooler talk the walk to the kitchen to grab some coffee get whatever um, is no longer there so to intentionally change that up and say uh, hey we're throwing out an agenda or a very light agenda today uh, let's just talk about like everybody's you know rosebud uh, that rosebud Born. I don't know if you guys have done that, but it's just what challenges are you facing? What what things are you excited about? You know, share with the team, and that actually got the team really excited to uh, to share about themselves versus we're talking about work all the time. Um, we also got a chance to talk about you know what vision the team wanted for the team. We uh, we sat in silence for five minutes. I asked them to journal. And they just journaled about what they would like the, this team to be, what they'd love it to look like. We went around the room and uh, the virtual room and asked, like, you know, what is it? You know, and, and everyone got to share what they felt passionate about, what they wanted to see. So that's been a, a way that we've tried to insert more of a human touch into our actions versus using them for work purposes. Um, and the last thing, I, th I said two, but I guess three. Uh, breakout rooms um, or another another more intimate setting from a large group to a small group that you can really facilitate that that connection um, that we love working with. Awesome. Um, Jeremy, how about you? How has your tool usage shifted? Yeah, so um, I you know, kind of touched on um, building off something I mentioned before about like turning off some of the notifications and stuff. Like um, kind of a funny story that even relates to this webinar that we're on right now um, and doing some preparation um, for this and, you know, kind of preparing some of my responses and stuff like, you know, I had a little bit of time to do it, but while I was doing it, like in between some of my other calls and meetings, I was getting blown up on Slack. <laughs> like I was getting all these notifications and you know, that, that noise, that, 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 that the noise that, you know, it makes, um, 
when you get like a, a, a Slack notification, like it's like starting to drive me crazy. <laughs> I was like, so I had to close out of Slack. And so that's kind of one thing that I'm doing, using Slack a little bit differently. Like if all of a sudden it's getting do too distracting, like just close out of it, shut it down. Like there's nothing that's that important. Like um, if it's something that important, like for me personally as a rep, like if it's a deal, like where um, I, somebody, I need to send out a contract, like that'll be either, that somebody will be either call or email me about that. Um, another thing like with Zoom um, that I've been doing, like me personally as a rep, like um, is this is something that our VP of marketing, Ryan O'Hara um, says, it's like, don't use any virtual backgrounds because like you really want to be your real authentic self to that prospect, um, you know, or even if you're managing a team, like, you know, you really want to be your real authentic self. And, you know, if you have a virtual background, like they don't know where you are, like you could be in like, you could be, you know, in like the devil's <laughs> cave or something like they don't know, you know, just be, be real and, and authentic. Like don't use virtual backgrounds. All, and obviously this is kind of obvious, but always have your camera on. Um, it seems obvious, but like, Still, some people like I, I'm, I was on a call yesterday and with a prospect and three out of the four people like that, you know, from their team, like didn't have their camera on, like, you know, be transparent, like about who you are, like you got nothing. Else. So um, definitely always have your camera on and, and be real. Um, and then also with Slack, you know, um, keep it light and use like gifs you know gifs and emojis to kind of keep it light and more casual um so people don't you know take you the wrong way your message the wrong way um and, and think you're maybe being a little bit too aggressive with them yeah um i think the virtual background thing's interesting um i can speak from experience when we first went work from home i figured it would be a week or two so i just kind of posted up at the kitchen table and a running joke with my team was um every time i was on a call over my shoulder my four-year-old daughter was watching Frozen all day long, <laughs> over and over and over. Uh, so that was kind of the running joke. So I did finally put a background up just to uh, myself the humiliation of Frozen. Uh, <laughs> and then within time, I clearly had to change the uh, spare bedroom into an office because we've been home for a while. Um, Rebecca, how about uh, how about with you? Change in how you're using tools? Absolutely. So firstly, Jeremy, I don't know where of this, but you can change the Slack sound. At one point, that knob. Oh. Was really too, was really too much for me. So I have yeah. this like, lovely ding. It's ah. kind of Tinkerbell esque, but you can you can go through and choose anyone that is that is most suitable to you. But yes, okay. uh, at one point I had to get rid of that knock. Mm -hmm. But but to um to that point, I, I I think that yes, there's a frequency problem, but these tools are are here to stay. Um, especially, I, I think we're going to be going back to the office on a full-time capacity. So it's really what's top of mind for me is, you know, how do we humanize these tools because they are here to stay? And um, touching on Moses' point, I, I've really noticed that now you're in back-to-back -back calls, you get on a Slack or you get, sorry, you get on a Zoom and there's no banter. Like I'm all about this hashtag bring back the banter because it's gone mm -hmm. and and it just we jump right into things even on Slack I think it actually makes it really easy and appealing to communicate in potentially a poor way and the tonality of, of the communication can be misread mm -hmm. so I think that we have to think about this like it's taken us some time to master email etiquette so you can use an email to deliver later. Um, instead of having a meeting, you write an email. I think now we have to learn how to master Slack and Zoom etiquette and how to humanize it. Um, so something that we've done um, is that we created um, an ask bot through Salesforce. So every time someone in the BDR team books a meeting, the whole company knows about it. So we want to humanize wins through Slack. Um, mm -hmm. We've also injected some culture into Slack um, just to soften the, the platform in general. We've had some, you know, um, social competitions through Slack. So I think really just maybe encouraging people to have more fun, use emojis, have organic conversation, bring back the banter because these tools are, are here to stay. Yeah, I think that's all really relevant. And to your point, um, it's so easy to fire off like a five word Slack. Um, and it probably sounds mean or short, but in your head, it was the same as having a five minute conversation and asking for whatever it was. So yeah, perception's definitely an issue. Um, I know I rely and I'm probably like 50% on it, but I always try to at least start with hi or good morning or how was your weekend before mm -hmm. I go into whatever it is I need. But like to Jeremy's point, there's times when you get eight, nine, 10, 12 slacks backed up and 
you just got to get through them. So, um, cool. We're coming up time, but the one thing I do want to kind of touch on before we wrap up is everything that we've talked about today, um, in one way or another, I think ties back to culture, right? I know like I can speak for my team. One of the things that I was most proud of was the team that, that I had built and, and, and we grew substantially was the culture. Like it was a tight knit group of people. We all genuinely enjoyed each other. Um, and we went work from home and like the initial like, comment I kept hearing was I miss my friends. Like I feel like I would go to work and see my friends. So I know there's a multitude of things that I've tried to do for like virtual happy hours and and our company has been great about you know, no more catered lunches. So they would actually like use Sendoso and send us DoorDash gift cards once a week to buy an employee's lunch. So we try to do a lot of things to preserve our culture. Um, what are you doing with your team specifically uh, to keep them engaged, keep that camaraderie and, and that team spirit alive? Um, Rebecca, you want to lead us off? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a really tough one and something that, you know, a lot of companies are focused on maintaining. Um, something that, that we did um, and we're trying to bring this back is that um, we would have outdoor sort of park meetups where we could meet outside, maintain distance, but actually see one another. Um, and we'd all really look forward to it. The weather is getting nicer, so we're hoping to, to do that again with the team. And it's a really great way to actually see one another. Um, another, another like fun idea that we've done recently that I actually, I don't think this is novel and, but is, um, we're like a walking challenge. Um, it's happening right now. It is out of control in the best of ways. We have people mm -hmm. that, are, that have walked a hundred kilometers in, in less than a week. And it's a really fun way to encourage people to go outside as well. Um, but yet like maintaining culture is is totally top of mind and i don't think it's necessarily solved with more zoom happy hours so it's really understanding what your team is missing and finding a way that doesn't actually lead to more burnout because i think times those zoom happy hours do yeah yeah totally agree um i've even tried to when possible like i'll send a quick slack to whoever i'm about to meet with and hey just call my cell phone right mm -hmm. and i'll try to and get some fresh air if I don't need Zoom. Um, again, it's really the face-to-face -face piece, but I think mm -hmm. it's equally like as important mentally to just get out, right? So to take the dog, walk around the block, just go stand in the yard and get some fresh air. Um, Moses, how about you? How's um, how, What are you doing to preserve culture? Yeah, so I, it, it's very interesting. We, we are trying to preserve culture, but we're also in a way building a new culture because everything is just so different. And um, in addition to trying to maybe see each other um, face to face in a socially distant, uh, safe way, uh, one of the things that I've really leaned in, you know, leaned in on, I think more so than before, was it was my team. Like uh, having, uh, for lack of a better word, culture champions, uh, because there's, you know, they receive messages from leadership all the time, and then leadership is holding them accountable, but also saying, "Hey guys, let's have fun today." Um, and it's just really, uh, it's really more impactful uh, when there's others on the team that are championing the, the culture. And I uh, found who those are on my team and had conversations with them and say, hey, this is a strong area. People gravitate to you. People respect what you, uh, respect you. Like what you do sets the tone for, for the team, uh, whether you, know, you buy into what we're doing or you know, lead something on your own. So I try to give them license and freedom and creativity to lean in to be that version of themselves that they love to do and also contributes from a peer perspective to that culture. And that can be over Zoom and over our uh, Slack channels, but they take on that, that leadership role and that initiative that they're well suited for and bring another dynamic of peer leadership and peer culture that we uh, we often miss when we're trying to create a culture. We often think uh, I'm the one who sets the tone for the team, and it's often not that not that way. It's the team themselves who who uh, create it. And uh, identifying your players who do that is super important. It's something we've really learned. Yeah. So um, we just had a question come in. So let's pivot to this quick, and then Jeremy, I'll come back to you on the culture piece. Um, so my buddy Chad from back in Boston. Um, how do you stay away from dashboard management uh, from an activity standpoint with, with everything being remote? Um, so like, I, th I think that's actually an important topic, right? How do you build that relationship of trust when you can't just look over at the desk and make sure everyone's dialing and emailing? Um, I'll kind of open that up to whoever wants to take it. 
Yeah, I feel like I'm in a very fortunate position in outreach uh, for our for our team because I do have not only their dashboard but also some other uh, really helpful tools that give me eyes on how they're doing things, not only what they're doing but how they're doing them. Um, so that's that's been an incredible tool for me to to use our own our own platform. Uh, so I have I have that visibility and I can see you know what they do when and how and that that provides good content for me to bring to our conversations, our one-on-ones, or if I'm seeing them kind of not pacing the way they need to, uh, I can reach out. But that allows me to uh, let the other uh, folks on the team, you know, do what they do best and just confirm that they are doing it without having to, uh, to ask them about it. Yeah. I think setting good expectations and then operating from a place of trust is, is really important because you can go down a rabbit hole in Salesforce dashboards and why haven't you why have you made 10 dials it's only 9 a.m like so yeah um. yeah and, and to that point also also even further the uh uh the amount of time that i expect them to have something done so i'll look at the previous day as well and say what did you complete during the day this allows me a good data sample size to say maybe you started late but you got it in or um, hey you were off your game yesterday and we can talk about that yeah so we are right up against time but i want to go back to jeremy for a second because I feel like you, in an office environment, are probably like the ultimate culture person, right? The stuff you do is hilarious. Uh, so how does someone like you that has such like an outgoing personality and is clearly a people person, right? Um, how are you, like, what are you doing to help the team with culture? How are you helping you know, yourself and other people stay engaged? Yeah, so um, at our one of our recent all hands meetings, we had Actually, it was it was not um, company wide all hands. It was just for our sales team, and there was like to, to keep things fun. Um, they had like different awards, like kind of like superlatives, you know, with the high, like if, you know your high school yearbook. Uh, I got the award for. Um, it's kind of vague, but I'll explain what it means. Like most engaged, like most engaged, and and so um, you know, in addition to like you know really outgoing personality, like you said, Joe. Um, people who know me, like people that are on here right now, you might know like I'm pretty active like on LinkedIn and I have kind of like this personal brand and stuff. So like one thing that I do to try to promote culture within the company is, you know, engage with other people's posts within the company. So we have a channel on Slack that is just called social. If anybody in the company, um, and this is one of our little secrets, how we have really good engagement on our posts on at Lead IQ. You know, if anybody in the company posts something on LinkedIn, you just take the link and you post it in that channel so that everybody will go and then, you know, engage with it. And I always do that. Like I'm engaging with everybody's posts and I'm also really, um, you know, active just like in Slack, like if somebody on the sales team like has a question about something like, hey, like how should I answer this objection or like what is the, what, how does this work? Like not if nine times out of 10, if somebody is answering that question, it's probably me. Cause like I've been here for a while. Like I'm, I'm you know, the most tenured sales rep here. I've been here for over three years now. So like I, and I'm willing to help other people at, um, you know, elder reps on the team, like they kind of just will be like, Hey, like, I know that you're the one that probably has an answer to this. Like, and, and so I'm really active, like just helping out other reps on the team, even, you know, even though I don't really have to. And, uh, I think other people appreciate that. Um, like one other thing with culture and like kind of piggybacking off the question that, that, um, that Chad had, Hey Chad, um, is, um, you know, we, we have this tool called 15.5 that's kind of like, hey, that helps managers manage reps, but more of a perception on how are they doing like as a person, you know, in addition to like, what, like you, you can ask like all these different questions to kind of get their pulse. And like two of the questions that we have is like, how, um, how do you feel like, how, how greatly do you feel appreciated? Like, you know, and, and like within the company, and personally and professionally, like how are you doing personally, but also professionally. Um, so that's a couple things that we're doing to like keep the culture um, alive and, you know, keep, allow managers to manage the reps. Awesome. And I think right on cue, I just saw Renee pop back in. So I think, uh, I think we are winding down, but I want to thank um, everyone who joined. Um, I obviously want to thank Rebecca, Moses and Jeremy. Uh, it was great having a chance to chat with you guys. Um, Renee, I don't know if you have anything to kind of close us out. I uh, just want to encourage everybody to head over to the arena. I think all of you have booths over there so people can continue the conversation with you there. 
And thank you all for, for a great session.